Kia ora, kia ora. Dion Jensen here. And on today's episode of Veteran Chats, I have the CEO of National RSA New Zealand, Karen Rolleston. Hello. Hi, Dion. How are you going? We're doing really good. We're doing our best on this online world. I've got a sick son home from school, sitting behind screen, doing his best to support daddy. And we've been bouncing back and forth trying to get all these screens going, but we made it. Great. We're going to talk to a couple of things that we discussed. And I've had a couple of, of, of presidents I've discussed uh, some things with, and I've identified a little bit of a gap. And I think a lot of our, our audience doesn't understand the business model. And, and with me coming from Regional Operations Manager for Asia Pacific, when we spoke, we all want the same things. And so my mind then goes to, so where are the gaps and what's stopping us getting to where we want to go in a safe conversation and away from all the negativity. So when we were emailing, I'm really interested in what is the process from a business perspective, if a veteran comes up with an idea, how do, how do they float that to the, to the RSA? What's the process? Okay, so so generally, like, like anything, it's generally a good idea to put your idea in, in um, writing and um, it can be forwarded to it can be forwarded to uh, one of the district presidents or it can actually come through here to national office itself. But I would say we get a lot of communication, but we get a, sometimes we just get a lot of ranting yep. and sometimes it's really really good if you've got a problem to outline the problem but actually talk about the solution and and what it is you actually want because sometimes that is missing and it's much easier for us to respond to somebody if they say hey I've got this problem um, I think we could solve it like this or um, do they want to meet with us can we arrange a meeting um, you know just those, those little bits of what is it you want us to do with this information you're giving us makes a big difference yeah, and see, this was the interesting um, point of that conversation we were having is, I know how to do that from a business perspective. I know how to do it with an, uh, an organizational perspective, but that's understanding the organizational makeup. So just to get on the Zoom call, I sent an email, this is who I am, uh, these are my intentions, uh, this is the objective I'm going for, these are the issues that I'm seeing, and I'd like to tackle them this way, and ask for consent in regards to the conversation. It happened really quickly, right? Great. Yeah, and, and that, that's the way it does happen really quickly. If, if you, you you approach us in a constructive manner, then we can respond constructively back to you. Excellent. And so I'm cheating a little bit because I know a lot about the RSA. So one of the <laughs> other reasons I wanted to have you on here is, you know, my family grew up in the RSA and I'll always defend the name of the RSA. But I didn't know a lot of the business structure. Like I didn't know that the RSA wasn't one whole body controlled from one point. So just for our listeners that might not know this, what is the actual makeup between like president's body and committee and national RSA and individual RSAs? How does that work? It's complex. <laughs> so basically we have 182 independent RSAs. So they are all um, incorporated societies in their own right. So they have their own rules, their own regulations and their own structure. And they are more or less free to do as they please. So I have no control over them whatsoever but each one of those belong to the RNZ RSA as a member and that is governed by a set of a, of a constitution and a set of rules which says if you want to belong to the RNZ RSA you need to do certain things and you need to you know you know adhere to those, those, those rules pay capitation those sorts of things so that's sort of how an individual RSA belongs to us and then under the governance structure we have a board of directors, um, which just like in a normal business behaves in the same way. So just just for um, clarity, they're all volunteers. Uh, you know, I see stuff out there all the time, all of these high paid board people and executives. No, they all give up their, good, their, their time. They're all volunteers. And yes, they are all business people, but they focus on the RNZ RSA and their focus is predominantly to make sure we live within our, our, our budget and that we've got the finances to deliver what we want to do. They are overall responsible for the strategy and over, overall responsible for compliance. So making making sure that when the RNZ RSA is going out there that we have a health and safety policy. It, it's the boring stuff, you know, it's the 
making sure we abide um, by the, the, the trustees um, rules, the incorporated societies, the trust, um, sorry, the Charities Act, you know, the, there's a raft yeah. of legislation and compliance that we need to adhere to. And then um, part of what they do too is looking at the professionalisation of the organisation. Are we doing things in a professional manner? Because, you know, New Zealand 30 years ago, or even 20 years ago, you know, you could sort of just be quite amateurish and you didn't have to worry about all this legislation. You could just, you know, tap someone on the shoulder and say, hey, bro, let's go do, do this or whatever. You, we don't operate in that environment anymore. There's a huge amount of risk and compliance and, the, and it's their job to make sure that we, we deal with that. Then we have the President's Forum, which is made up of all the district presidents. Yep. And their responsibility is A, they're voted in by each of the, the RSAs. Yep. And their responsibility is to be the link between the, the office here, the national office, and the membership. So they're supposed to be out there talking, and as they do, talking to their local RSAs, finding out what the issues are, and then feeding that back up up the chain and the same thing is when we do stuff here um, they obviously get them um, should be you know feeding that back out to to the members as well so if I take into account what you just said there Karen and, and put in the context of me walking into Asia Pacific we've got every Asian country I'm walking in there as a regional operations manager I represent the company the company the board of directors everything that comes all the way through comes down to me and I'm responsible but I have command and control over these countries but those documents that we work off and and, and over on our side that 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 risk document is one of the main ones right yeah our, that comes all the way down that, that that the whole risk document and what we're doing is really important but so is the the regional strategy document we've always, we're always working to a strategy document but when you say constitution how was that formed i mean because in, in my head i say to myself okay i'm doing all these things as a new zealand veteran but not under the umbrella of a veteran, I'm, I'm doing it under Dion Jensen. And when I step into the veteran space, I activate my status as a veteran to say, hey, I've got a voice here because I'm a veteran. But because I can do it business-wise, we're speaking the same language. So if right now, because we know we all agree that, you know, we want to make sure that that um, we're current, all right? We, we need to honor our history, but we need to stay current and serve our current members and their families. And I hear a lot of talk about, you know, younger veterans. We want to communicate, connect more with younger veterans. Are younger veterans represented in involvement in that constitution's creation or adaptation or updating? And are they involved in that committee group members? And for the, the guys with the big voices that really want to come in and change, how do they get onto the committee? How does that whole process work? Right. So, you know, the constitution is just a legal document and, and, and you know, how, how an organisation behaves and how it's formed and is controlled. So that, that is very much um, is a document that's a living document and it gets changed all the time. And that is done by, um, at National Council, um, you, you, every RSA turns up, uh, if they want to make some amendments to the constitution, there's some rules around timing and how they go about doing that. Yep. And then that gets voted by by national council as to whether that's accepted or or it's not accepted. So that's really how the, the constitution sort of sort of works. But it is based on a on a you know like a a sort of a template of what a constitution looks like for sure. for any organisation. But there's just some unique bits that are unique to the to the RSA. But they can be adapted and changed at any any time. Okay, because you know what I'm doing. <laughs> I can see it all over your face. So. so yeah. With the conversation, we, we're now shaping towards, okay then, because, you know, I'm a big on accountability. Yep. You know, I'm my own man. I'll do what I think is right. And I try to be polite with that. That's the difference, right? So even if I disagree, I'm not going to take shots at an organization that one taught me how to shoot. So I'm not going to take shots at the defense force. That's just silly. I'm never going to take a shot at the RSA because that's that's where our family grew up. So the, the conversation is now shaped towards if there is anyone that is really or disgruntled with how everything's sort of running, those avenues are there, right? One, one, you've obviously got to be a member. <laughs> that, that helps, right? You can't, you can't expect an organisation to to listen to you if you're not a if you're not a member. I mean, you know, paying a membership fees, and, and we, you know, we're responsible to members, so we're not responsible to to anyone else out there. So you have to be a member as the the first yeah. part. Yeah. And probably that's that's one of the, the biggest fundamental understandings we have to have. And I, and I have discussions with lots of people, especially for an interview. 
And, yeah. and I went across the broad range. You know, you've got your avid supporters like me and, and my family. You've got your haters. And, and if look, if you've been in any environment and you're pushing ahead, you want to affect change, you're going to have haters. All right, that's just part yeah. of the environment we're used to in business. Definitely. But one of the the common themes that's coming out is this: people don't understand that it's it's not an automatic entitlement that the RSA is there that they must provide for every return serviceman. Yeah. That, was a, that was an interesting mind, mindset I came across. Yeah, so th there's two pieces there. As an organisation, when it comes to our support services, we will support anybody who has served, is currently serving, and their family. So you don't need to be a member to do that. We've, we've already guaranteed, you know, we've been around for 100 years, and right from those early beginnings, we've always said you don't need to be a member to, to get to get support but if you want to change the organization yes you need to be a member well that, that, that makes sense to me business wise if i take myself back to a young soldier in an alpha company back in the 90s i would be thinking well, hang on a second now rsa is supposed to be doing this 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 and this and then when we get to these deals we understand where it's sort of interlinked so just to clarify if you've served currently serving have served in your family you're always going to get assistance from the rsa regardless Correct. But it's an independent organisation, which is under independent organisational rules, uh, founded on a constitution, and you have to adhere to all the legal side outside of that. So if I just, and I'll make this nice and quick, because you've answered all my questions just by outlining this, because this will create a discussion afterwards after I post this. Yep. If we could agree, that's an interesting way, I'm not asking for agreement here. If we could examine what you think the top three commonalities are for return servicemen and their families for the last hundred years till now, what do you think would be the three main things that they would expect to see or feel or have access to walking into any RSA in the country? Their expectations. Um, their, their expectations, and, and it should be, the first and foremost is you should be welcomed. You know, and you know, I hear all the time that people go into, you know, RSAs and they don't feel welcomed. Well, that's really unfortunate because that's not how it should be and that's not every RSA in the company uh, in the country. And I think sometimes we just need to remember we're all human and sometimes sometimes we have bad days too. Yep. And um, you know, just because you had one bad experience, I mean I would I would go back and I would you know, perhaps challenge some of that, that thinking or, you know, introduce yourself or, you know, there, there's always a way a way around it. But, you know, first and foremost, you're, you're quite right. People want to feel welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, two others? Um, you know, I think as a veteran, you want to feel that your service is respected. Um, and, you know, we've heard, heard that all through history as well, you know, the yeah, 100%. And just to talk about the feeling welcome, uh, my mother-in-law's from Napier. She's passed now, but we used to eat at the RSA all the time. And Napier was good feed, good feed up there in Napier, RSA, man. And I walked in there one time and you know, I wasn't a member, but there was some rule somewhere, had nothing to do with the RSA, but just something was going on for that particular day where I said, oh, listen, I'm, I'm not actually eating. Um, it's just my wife and kids are eating. I had a big feed and I'm just coming, I'm just going to have a coffee, right? And so they're like, oh, you can't sit here if you're not eating. And that was just a rule at that particular time. That was fine. It was very politely yeah. put across. I said, hey, listen, no, no disrespect, um, but I'm a veteran and this is sort of my home. I just want to sit down with my family. I'll, I'll pay if, if you want me to pay, but I'm not eating. <laughs> I just want to sit here and drink coffee. And she goes, listen, let me just talk to the manager. Look, that's fine. No problem. So here's someone that's yeah. just following the rules that she was asked to do in the restaurant at the time. As soon as I mentioned veteran, we don't like doing that, right? But I'm just like, man, I just really want to sit here with my family. But as soon as I mentioned that, they were like, hey, no problem. But then they asked, are you a member? Because I hadn't, <laughs> I'm still not a member because I was waiting because I hadn't been to an RSA where I felt what it used to feel like. And so that's why I introduced, uh, I interviewed Simon from Titahi Bay because my family's down that end. Yeah. And because of the Remembrance Army element, I was like, well, I'll, I'll join that one. You know, and then, then we'll be fine. So yeah, feeling welcome is a biggie. Um, and number two, I heard you say was that our service is respected. Yes, yes. So I hear that quite often from younger younger veterans that they don't feel that their service is respected. Um, but 
again, it's it's, it's like like all things. You, you can go down to the warehouse one day and have a, you know, a brilliant experience, and someone's very helpful. And the very next day, you can go and get a different person, and it's you get a bad experience. So that's not to justify certainly that that, that should happen at all, but unfortunately, it does. And you know, if you come across that, I would you know, ask that you contact the president of the club or, or speak to the president of the club and just sort of point that point that out because most of the presidents of our clubs don't want this happening either and you find yeah. it's just one or two old grumpy people that, um, you know, perhaps <laughs> just need to have a, a, a quiet word in their ear about how they felt when it was done to them. So a president of an RSA, let's do a fictional one, okay? So here, here's an RSA, how does someone get to be a president? Um, well, generally, um, the same same way as you do in most clubs, you know, there'll be an executive and, and there'll be an AGM and at the AGM time you can put your hand up and say, I would like to be president or on the executive committee or, or whatever and it, it's voted in. So it's no different than your local sports club or your, your local citizens and ratepayers club or, or, or any, any club, it, it is via, you know, put your hand up. I want to be involved and then you get elected in and you find you know we've got a lot of clubs where we've got we've got a club that, that the other day where we've got someone who's the president of the club it's just a small club but he's 86 years old and he doesn't really want the responsibility sure but nobody else is putting their hand up to say they want they, they you know hey i'm here to here to help here so to help. you know we've got a lot of people in some of these these, these particularly the smaller clubs that you know there's such a sense of responsibility for these people that they're continually doing it and by the time you're you know you're 86 that shouldn't be his responsibility anymore it should be time for someone else to step up and take that responsibility yeah and, that, and to me that comes down to a communication model right like i'm, I'm unaware of all of this is why i'm interviewing you yeah. <laughs> because you know me i've got a big mouth once i find this all out i'll blast it out then and create more conversations and we'll get there i know we'll get there because the, the motors for everyone, regardless, because there's a lot of people we butt heads with. I'm a big personality, you're a big personality. We're going to bump heads with people where we're adults, right? But that's going to create the energy if it's if it's shaped the right way to, for us to all move forward. And I'm starting to feel that this year. And if someone's really butting heads now, I'm finding that it's more passion than negativity now. Because, is, would you agree? Oh, look, there's huge amounts of the passion in this organization that's one thing we're not we're not short of is 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 passion but you know sometimes we don't have the right tools to work together and we've got to remember that we're a we're a team and and you know individuals always have this this need to be want to be right but sometimes actually you know there's more than one way to do something and it's not necessarily that your way's right or wrong or whatever but you know, at some stage, someone has to make the decision as to which way we're going, and that's when we need people to, you know, be part of a team and get them behind and, and accept that that's what we've what we've got to do going forward. Yeah, and I've got a very simple um, measuring stick that I use. It's quite simple. The manner in which you're communicating, the manner in which you're behaving, would you be allowed to do that while you're still wearing the uniform that you're now utilising in order to have this discussion? Yeah. And a lot of what I see is no, you can't talk to people like that if you're in uniform rank aside there's just things that you don't do while you represent that uniform so you can't call yourself a veteran and then walk in there and act like an absolute disrespectful bullying type personality because if you're in uniform one you get knocked on your backside and secondly you do this in a civilian environment you only get trespassed and locked up and this is where i like actually being an ex-cop as well because i sort of see both sides and, and with the business stuff sitting over the top i'm sitting there well hang on a second this is a an organization where you're allowed in there if you're a member or if you want support and you're, that, that, those are the rules, all right? And there's rules there that we go through. And then my head then goes to these individual RSAs, who owns the land? Who owns the building? Are they owned by the individual organization's entity or are all those RSAs owned by a national body? How does that work? No, and that is, that, is, that is actually one of the big challenges we've got at the moment. And um, we are reviewing local constitutions and, and we've got, the solicitor at the moment looking at how we can protect the assets because that is that is a huge problem those assets, the way that i look at it is those assets have been built up by you know veterans of, of past and if you're a member you, you know and they're owned by the individual rsa or the individual incorporated society so legally those assets belong to the members so those right. members choose what happens to those assets 
But I look at it, and it's more a moral argument than a legal one, that you should be looking after those assets as a guardian for, for veterans in the, in the future. That's not to say that they always need to, you know, if it's a house that always needs to be a house, they might want to be repurposed for a more, more relevant asset, but there still should be that ownership of that. And we are finding um, that we do have a few RSAs that say, well, we're the members, um, we can choose to do what we like with them. And legally they can, yep. but um, sometimes that's not in the best interests of of veterans. And, yeah. and, See, this and is an interesting one from a business perspective. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. I mean, I, I'm living proof, right? I mean, what do I know about business when I left the army? Nothing, right? Yeah. And, and 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 failed a lot and, and and stuffed up a lot until I had to learn a different skill set. So, I trust soldiers to be soldiers. I don't trust soldiers to be business people unless they've got a business background. So, if you had, you know, the the soldier's mindset and the problem solving aligned to some of a good business brain, those RSAs did really well. And we look at the business model of the RSLs in Australia; they do phenomenally well. Fiscally, uh, community-wise, they're always flush financially, like super flush financially. And it's so embedded into the community. Um, and I see that even going to Napier RSA because of the food, right? We have a big feed. You know what it's like? You go down to Corumban or, or, or Southport um, or Surfers, any of those big RSLs in Aussie, you know, they're a uh, fully functional business model. So when I hear you say the members have the business control of an asset, I straight away think, God, I hope they know what they're doing business-wise. So is there is there like a consultancy model that the RSA National has? That, does RSA National have the ability to bring in business consultants and sit with these individual RSA and, and, and do that side or? Yeah, so so we can. We will we will always offer help. And, and you know, we've got, you know, the RSAs have got a lot of members, so we've got a lot of expertise amongst amongst members, but we have to be asked first and, and um, the local, um, you know, incorporated society has to be willing to, you know, be open and frank about what that is. Yep. Most of the time, they, they're they not interested in, in, in our support because they'll rely on their their local people or their local advisors. So, See, so, I'd be super cheeky in this. Let's just say where I'm living now, there was no RSA. And I knew there was a few people around that could benefit from an RSA. I could legitimately come to you and say, hi, Karen, I think there's enough people here to start an RSA. I've got a building. What's the process from that point if I just wanted to start an RSA? Because once you come under the banner of an organization, there's rules and regs and that, but it's doable, right? Or if there's a vacant RSA somewhere, what if there's an asset in a small country town, the building's just closed down, someone could open that back up again and, and, and crack on, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So you know, if you wanted to start an RSA, you would obviously, you know, get get together. You'd you'd you'd, um, you'd put a submission in, and then that would be that would be considered. I mean, we're not interested in obviously, you know, in our two RSAs right next door to each other. So there yeah, would yeah. have to be a, a, a good business case as to as to why you would want to. And see, we use a, business case as the language. Yeah. You know, we get a group of veterans that want to do something, and then it's a business case. That's the gap that I'm seeing every time I, I look at this and I have this conversation. And I think the more that we understand what that looks like as a, as, as a visual, I'm a flow diagram guy, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I see RSA National Body and all these other RSAs and within those we've got all these rules and regs and it just, it all just flows down, it makes sense to me. But for those that are putting this together with the, with the wairua and the spirit of what the RSA is supposed to be, because that's, the, that's what you feel, that's the difference. Yeah. That's why it feels one way when you go into the National Wauru Museum, and it feels a different way when you walk into Johnny Slash's Onward Bar. Yeah. It's the spirits there. And I think yeah. that's probably one thing we can all agree on is it's how it feels when you walk in, and you know it straight away. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember, and I won't say which one, but I remember, and it's really no, no one's fault. So I remember going into one of the ones that's associated to a cosy club. And I walk in there, I was like, man, this feels nothing. The RSA is that little corner bit over there, and over there's Cosy Club stuff with, yeah. with Bingo and that. So, no one, well, I shouldn't say no, I can't speak for everyone. I don't want to see people recreating what the RSA stood for for 100 years. So I'll put that on record now. Yeah. I don't want the RSA replaced. I don't want people saying, I could do it better than the RSA. Well, if you can do it better than the RSA, get into your local RSA and do it from the inside out. Um, and from Asia Pacific, they only do that one way, they just go and take it over. So, 
if my local RSA, yeah, so let's just say my local RSA in Palmy, if I wanted to reinvigorate that, I'd go in there, find out who the president is and say, hey mate, I'd love to come in and, and get this to, to what it used to be for my family. I've got kids now, you know, um, and I, I would you know, want everyone to feel welcome and, and service honored, but have that, the other one for me is that link to community. Because, you know, Brother Dip, who's, who, who's dead now, picture behind me, he's buried in um, Te Oraha Cemetery, um, up in that end, there is no small town in this country that doesn't have a cenotaph. Where yeah. someone hasn't gone from that community somewhere. And I'm really missing that plug in. Um, you know, Himatangi Beach, where I want to build the Line Academy for everyone down there. You know, it's got a local surf life savings, Gozzi Club, it could have a little RSA down there, all, all those sorts of things. It's doable when people understand what the map is. Yeah. Because if I had a thousand, if I had a thousand people behind me right now, I could walk into Palmer's North RSA, speak to the president, say, "Hey, listen, there's a thousand guys here ready to help sign up, become members, put our blood and and money and time that into it, and it would blossom again." Yeah. And I see all the poppies sitting behind me. That's what sort of really needs to happen. Um, as as a, so this is interesting because I'm speaking to you as the CEO of the RSA, but you're also the wife to, uh, <laughs> you know, to, um, to. Rolly, right? So you you see both sides. Yeah. And the, the big gun I'm bringing in, I'm going to let everyone know now, I might as well let you know as well, Karen. I'm telling my mum. But I'm bringing the big gun in. I'm like, you know what? Someone needs to come in here and you need to hear it from a 30 plus year army wife that went in and just seen this from right across from being the blonde Afro lady at the front of Nazi 2's MCG in Singapore all the way through. As I'm just going to bring her in because she is, we've tried to keep her quiet through this whole RSA thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because man, you bad mouth the RSA in front of my mum, she will strangle you. Because <laughs> we grew up there, so I'm going to bring mum on. I'm going to go, hey mum, from your generation and nan and pop, and my nan is a, was a lifetime member. You no know, pop, and then when when my pop died when I was in Boz, RSA gave money for us to come home for funerals and stuff like that. So we've seen RSA support in action, and I don't like seeing people take a shot at the name. Now individual RSAs they vary as far as quality and service and all that sort of stuff goes. That's people, right? But the name has to be honored. It's been there for a hundred years. So unless you're a hundred years old and you haven't for the last hundred years been running around helping people, you probably really shouldn't be taking a shot at a name that's been there for a hundred years. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the reality in the veteran space at the moment is we've got so many different veterans organizations, so many different Facebook pages, you know, and it's not coordinated and it's, it's like anything, you know, if you can coordinate and organise and have one voice and and you certainly don't have to be all one organisation, that's not what I'm saying at all, yeah, I yeah. mean, I want to make that really clear, is you can have multiple organisations but if you can align and, and agree what you agree on and have a united voice, it's so much easier to advocate for change you know, at a government level, legislation and, and get some of these things that, the, you know, everybody wants, you know, definition of a, of, of a veteran, you know, some of the veterans, um, you know, the VA Act and, and, and whatnot and get some of those sections repealed or changed or whatever. But to do it, you have a united voice, you need to have a united voice. And some of the problem with this fracturedness is it makes it really easy for government not to have to deal with us because, oh, you know, they can't organise themselves, they're all arguing, they're, they're whatever. In some ways, it's, it's it's not a lot different than iwi settlements. You know, when, when the iwi come together and they can they can agree on a path forward, they get some money and you look at my toe and they've done some really great stuff. Yep. Yet the, the ones that have still got lots of factions and are infighting have got nothing. Yeah. So, and it's, I see that the same as the veteran community, if we can, you know, agree on what we agree on. There'll always be stuff we disagree on. I think it will take the veteran community much, much further forward. And and actually, you know, it's actually the legislation we need to change, and we need to stop being angry at each other. Yeah, and look, there's enough. As far as the emotion of anger, anger goes, anger is love disappointed, right? So people's hearts are in this. That's why we've got it. All. If their hearts are in it, no one really cared. Just fade away. Right? So, so I get that side. I've stepped out of that quite a lot to go because I'm, I'm global now. I've got, I've got my network's bigger than the defense force, the police force and emergency services combined. So my yeah. messaging goes out to 30 million people. That's that's where my mouth goes to at the moment. So I, I cut my teeth in the veteran space, PTSD, defense force, that sort of stuff. Then I went out of the corporate, same stuff, different language, went higher, same stuff, different language, went to this country, same stuff, different language, went to that country, same stuff, different language. So I've got all these different languages now. 
And one thing is always the same where we've been successful overseas is that space firstly must be safe. So I've always had this idea that whenever we come in to discuss things, it needs to be in a space that has a code of conduct. Yeah. There has to be an agreement on how we communicate because we're all fighters or warriors. You know, as soon as it's perceived as a shot, everyone's going to fight. And we're seeing it with Black Lives Matter. We're seeing it with as soon as you pick a side, then one, psychologically, that's how people actually cope and survive. They've got to have an enemy to be a soldier, to have value and stuff, right? But if we just had a, a neutral space that is regularly communicated into, and this is how you don't do it. You don't form a, a veterans advisory group where you select who's in it. <laughs> so Australia did that, right? So I've been in this space for a long time, and I know a lot of what's going on behind the scenes. So you can't create, okay, we're going to be this council for veterans, and we're going to speak on behalf of all veterans when things happen for our country, and then you only pick your mates. Yeah. And then everyone else is like, well, hang on a second, I've got a different point of view to you, and then you get slain, <laughs> right? So there's got to be a safe space. The other thing, too, is that space has to be led but not owned. And that's a key difference. So if the RSA said, hey, listen, we're having a, a, a veterans meeting in regards to doing an assessment of all the RSAs in New Zealand, where do you feel welcome? Where do you feel that your service is honoured? And where would you be happy taking a civilian mate or someone from your rugby team in there as well where they're not excluded for not being a service mate because we're part of the community? And then we could come into that space, everyone could do whatever, do your surveys and all the rest of it, and then we could go on. And then any veteran should be able to do that. Or actually anyone that is a president for an RSA or a member, anyone who's a member of an RSA should be able to go, hey, listen, I've got an issue in my town. Can I jump into this bubble um, under the RSA banner and go, hey, listen, I want to talk about this. And we should be able to all fold in support. If it, if it connects with what we're doing, we can feed into it. If it doesn't, at least we're aware of it, we can point the other direction to someone else. And we're seeing that now, like this Wednesday night, is a free workshop, a solution-focused workshop, organized by a veteran through his journey for really, really good reasons. So he's just found a space. Hey guys, we're running this free workshop and we're all folding in. Well, not all, but yeah. those of us that align to that message, PTSD, suicide, that have solutions, we're folding into that space to support him. He'll do his thing and he'll toodle off and do his thing with his team and we'll toodle off and do our thing. So we should all be able to fold into these spaces, support what we need to do where it's led but not owned. And I think if we can get to the point, and that's what I'm doing, right? So I'm just pulling people on, having these discussions yeah. so they can go back out and it can come back in. And I will gradually pull that into a safe online space. Don't own it. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave this little space here because I own the Lion Academy, we're gonna have these discussions. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about is professionalism and accountability. So you represent a legal entity in New Zealand. Yes. So we have to be professional. And we're accountable for that if we're in those positions. And that's another gap I see a lot of veterans wiggling through because they're not accountable to anyone once they're out. They can jump on, take a shot on Facebook, go away, do whatever, form opinions. And as a professional, this is me going, oh. so as a professional, you can't go go back at them, <laughs> you know? So all of a sudden you sit there like a punching bag for a while. And so that's something I'm gonna step in and deal with in a few more weeks to see what drops out of this. So I acknowledge that as an organization, you've taken some hits, but I also wanna acknowledge on this interview, you've taken hits from guys that know you can't hit back. And there's certainly enough of us around now that uh, had enough of that. So we'll all come in and talk first. And I think it's really important. Uh, if you saw the interview of Johnny Slash yeah. um, from Onward Bar, he, he's saying the same thing. So he's probably the humblest dude we've got, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and even he's saying, look, we need younger veterans in these communities and, and lock this RSA thing down. He's not firing shots at the RSA. He's like, we need to fold into the space and, and collectively come up with an agreement. But again, New Zealand's democracy, it's gotta be a, a majority view, right? And so we can't keep handing to the minority view within an organization. And I see that energetically as a real clash now. As soon as you say minority and you can't hand you to the minority, it's like, oh my God, you're racist this or this, that. No, it's an organization. Yeah. And the organization is there to serve the majority of the members. So if a small percentage of you doesn't want anything to do with the RSA, don't. Cool, go do your own thing. But for those that want to keep the RSA's name going and keep that all going, then anyone watching this that still you know, believes in what the RSA stands for, it's been here for a hundred years, those of us that grew in it, that want to get in there and help, especially those that you are sitting there thinking, that's not what it used to be. Join an RSA, join your local RSA or pick one and go in there and support. 
I mean, the fees aren't that much. I mean, I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to join up too. <laughs> but the fees aren't that much, and you'll, you'll have a voice within your own RSA. And if there's enough of us with a positive voice, then I think we get there. Yeah, and I mean, the reality is, because of the way they're structured, like, like you said before, if you get a group of you, you know, a group of young veterans that are all, you know, think things should change and they don't like the way the local RSA is run, join up, get on that executive, take it over, make it what you want to make it, and there's your accountability. Then you're accountable for, for what, <laughs> what it ends up being. Yeah, a little bit different when you got your name on the bottom of the signature block for something, you know, when all of a sudden it's like, oh, hang on a second, it's not that easy once you're in it. Yeah. Oh, we just need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do this. All right, bro, there you go. It's all yours. Ooh, why can't we do that? Because of this, this, and this. Oh, we didn't know that. Yeah. No, he didn't, but he still took a shot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we've got a, we've got a lot of RSAs now that we are, you, you know, they've been run by civilians because they're the only ones that are stepping up. So, you, you know, they, they will take it in the direction that they feel is the the right way to go and again you know if you don't like that as a veteran well get your mates together join up take it over and then turn it back into what you think your vision of a rsa should be because the other thing to remember is an rsa doesn't have to be what we currently have as in i'm talking about the hospitality part of it. it doesn't have to have a bar it doesn't have to have a restaurant it can be you know as long as the core of the the DNA of the RSA, which is, you know, remem remembrance, support and advocacy. As long as we've got that in the DNA and the heart of each RSA, then we're in a good space. Because let's, let's you know, not all veterans are the same. We're a broad church. We've all got different interests. We all want to do things a different way. But so long as we all believe in those three pillars, then, then I think we're fine. But um, there's the challenge, I, and I say that to everyone I, I meet. Really easy to throw stones from the outside, but if you don't like what you see, get involved and, 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 and change it. Yeah, and those, those three pillars are critical. Um, remembrance, I mean, that's, we, we've got to stick, we've got to honour that. And any time you take a shot at a historic name, I mean, you're not. Sorry, I mean, some of these guys are my mates, but no, don't take a shot at my granddad, I'll kick your ass. All right, so remembrance, I won't even edit that out, I'm a big boy. So remembrance have to, um, support's an interesting one. Um, and so support, I am picking links closely to veteran affairs, that, that particular pillar or, or separate budgets, or we, we got some um, budget, budget capabilities with an RSA to provide direct support for veterans or is that? Well, so, yeah, yeah, so, so that, that's another big mis misunderstanding around is the support services. So. And my team here, like we're a small team at National Office, there's only seven of us, right? Three of those are 100% dedicated to support. So you've got Richard who does our advocacy work. So when VA turns you down or um, if you're, uh, you know, um, covered by ACC now and the ACC goes, no, that wasn't work, wasn't defence related, who steps in and fights for that for you? Well, yep. we have we have a team member here that does that and those cases are really complex they go on for years and you know there's you know a couple of hundred hours worth of worth of work in that so that's part of the advocacy but for we advocate for individual veterans because even though you might be qualified for um you know veterans affairs doesn't necessarily mean it always goes your way um yeah. so you need someone who can do an appeal and do a review and so we take care of that then each of the uh, then we have our district support managers, which um, our support team here look after. So in each district, um, there's there's one of those, and we set the policy and and we do a lot of um, both um, Danny and Rob here do a lot of work with veterans as well. And they get really complex, you know, like we have people in Australia that um, don't have a passport, have hit rock bottom, homeless, no money, only families back here in New Zealand. Yeah. So. And and so we'll deal with all of that, get them a passport, get them home, wrap some support around them when they get back. But that's, again, that, that's really complex because there's, there's all these different bits and pieces that come into it. So we're, we're always dealing with stuff like that. Some of the Veterans Affairs stuff, it can be quite, quite simple depending on your needs. Other times it's not, so you've got to have someone to look after you. And I get really angry when people say we're not looking after young veterans. 80% of our advocacy work is under uh, is for veterans under 50. And you only need to talk to one of our district support people who are out there in the regions and, and they run off their feet with, you know, processing um, 
applications helping people connect with veterans affairs or if they're homeless finding them homes or they're, if they're unemployed you know hooking them up with you know um, MSD so they can register for a for a, a, a benefit and, and all that although these things might sound really straightforward if you have been a young no, 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 no. they joined at they're 17 not. or 18 and you've never had to do any of this stuff you suddenly get out you transition poorly you hit rock bottom and and you don't know how to connect with government departments or we well, might not even have a gp because you had yep. no one told you how to go and find a gp when you left the army exactly i mean i remember when we left the army to get a flat <laughs> you know we were hopeless right i mean i organize free frontline counseling here in palmerston north with help our project so it doesn't matter if you're if you're a frontline staff member at all. You go down to Health Hub Project in Palmy, GPs, psychs, counselors, everything you need down there, and you just give the code DJVIP from VIP Kiwi. You go down there, you'll get seen, you'll get registered for free, so they waive that fee, and you'll get an appointment from a, a counselor who will sit down there and at least be a signpost and go, okay, what's going on? In normal language, right? What's going on? Or oh, this, this, and this is going on. Cool. And they go, well, actually. You're told to this here. Have you spoken to your RSA advocate here? You got this, and they know all this stuff. So a lot of the time, it's it's a it's an expression of frustration. And then when you can get past that expression of frustration, you actually drill down with the person and say, "What are you dealing with? You know, it's either going to be trauma, it's going to be value, or it's going to be life stuff. Those are the only sort of three areas. And I've done this veterans all around the world come through my door somewhere through social media, right? And um, there's been champions like Wayne Lindsay in Australia. So when I was dealing with suicidal vets on the Gold Coast, he pops up, Vietnam vet, talk to Wayne, bro, how does this all work? And he's like, bang, 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 bang. I'm like, where is all this information? And it's the same with veteran affairs. And I'll try and get Bernadine on for the next interview. You can help me with that, Karen. That'd be great. Then I can get, yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm forming this infographic in my mind the more people I talk to. So there's a, there's a figure in the middle that you're either currently serving, no longer serving, legal veteran status, not legal veteran status, which is a, which is interesting anyway, or, or family member. So those are the sort of five demographics in the middle. And so what support do you have? First port of call might be here, here, whatever that is, there's, there's all these places that you can go, all of these options in this big pie chart, spoke wheel, hub thing, whatever you want to call it, that people are just really unaware of. Or yeah. you create it like I have for my thing where I know if someone comes in my door, I know who I can connect them to. If it's crisis response at two o'clock in the morning in New Zealand, I know who I'm sending them to. If it's yeah. after nine o'clock in the morning, this is happening, I know who I'm, it's because I know those bits. But I think for the veteran support space and the veteran space collectively or the New Zealand Defence Force spaces, that map infographic is not there yet. And I really want to be able to build that. So if I can get, you know, RSA's map and, and know where that is and I get veteran affairs and put it there and when I started doing that the first thing I could not believe I couldn't, couldn't believe this you deploy you're in the defense force you deploy on qualifying service to to somewhere you come back so you've done pre-deployment training you've deployed you've come back and you're doing post-deployment stuff right so everyone in the defense force knows that all those guys and girls from that deployment have qualifying service right yeah and that does not get plugged immediately into veteran affairs system. So all those people when they leave, they're gonna go knock, knock, knock. Hi, veteran affairs. Um, I was on that operational deployment. Veteran affairs goes, prove it. He's like, bro, oh, really? And, and so when I uh, emailed the minister and I said, as soon as a defense force member completes qualifying service, it's the same blinking database, right? Just plug them straight in and then when they go to leave, so when you leave, these are all the support that you have. You're registered with Veteran Affairs. They already know you're a veteran, already got qualifying service. If any of these things happen, do this. If not RSA, do this. If not, do this. That map doesn't exist yet, but we all have pieces of it. And so I'm seeing my role, if I can bring enough people in to put all these pieces of this map together, that'll cut out a lot of the stuff. You know, if someone goes, hey, um, my back's playing up from a bad parachute jump, uh, medical injury, during service, yes, thing. During service, no, thing. It, sh it should really be that simple. Yeah. We do so data data is a, is a huge, huge problem. And it's a problem for the RSA because we don't have a lot of data. We're building data systems at the moment because you can't tell a story without the, the statistics. So, you know, otherwise it's just 
anecdotal evidence and that's not good enough these days. And it's not just us. Veterans Affairs doesn't have the data and neither does Defence. Defence can't, you know, haven't recorded. They couldn't tell you how many people, how many veterans we've got. They've got no idea because they never kept that information and didn't have the, the data and the systems to build it. So the things that you're talking about is, is absolutely great. But the reality is the systems um, and the data isn't there to be able to do that yet. And I so we need to start. It. We need to start there. Then I got a message from one of the boys in Singapore. They are collating a list of all the, the data does exist. So it's not like saying the data doesn't. The data exists, but yeah, we but don't have it. Place. We don't have it in a central exactly. Place. But yeah. just like the map, every single one of us has got access to that data piece. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So if I'm a consultant, I put my consultant hat on now. Hi, Dion. So this is the situation. We need all the data that's out there at the moment and we need this list of data so that we can do this to report that to achieve this. I go, great. So what's my first data point that we need? We need to know Vietnam veterans between this year and this year. Cool. Hunt that down. What's the next one? Can be done. And I say it can't be done. It's, it's just nobody's done it and it's not recorded at the, at, the, at the moment. Right. So the timing of this interview is really, really good now. So anyone watching this, um, I'm going to put my hand up for this, all right? Because I got a big mouth and I like playing with technology. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to achieve the status of super geek online. Failed today, obviously, because I couldn't find my laptop cord. I'll edit that bit out. But if we can, <laughs> we, we need a strategy meeting. We need, we need us to all sit down as soon as we can. Those of us that are, okay, here's the qualifying criteria. I want to help. That's it. That's got to be the qualifying criteria. And so if, if we can call a meeting, um, I'll host it. I'll even pay for the tea and coffee. We can host it here in Palmy, invite everyone that wants to have a discussion, code of conduct, rules of the meeting, turn up, be polite. We are just looking to establish what data is required to get to that point and who can go out and help and where we're going to put it. It's a mission, eh? We all love that stuff. We need to put a... Yeah, and, you've got a, and, and, and just with my risk hat on again, there's a whole lot of privacy stuff that goes along with that. So, you know, you need to make sure that, that you, you know, you abide by the new privacy acts and whatnot. Oh, we're all across GDPR and Age Pacific, Karen. Oh. We're all over that stuff, mate. All yeah, that's the standard we need to. Invest. Yep, that there's ways around all of that. We just we just put it out there. So if you are these people, then you can feed that, and that we can. Yep, definitely have to respect privacy. Good one, business mindset things. GDPR. Yeah. How many online courses you had to do to tick that box when you when that came out? Nightmare, right? Yeah, big nightmare. Yeah, and of course, none of us fast forwarded to the end and the multi choice questions and checked <laughs> ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so look, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of hope this year. I'm seeing 2020, the year of perfect vision, being a really interesting year. I mean, COVID just gave us a whole lot of energy. If you attach negativ negativity to it, then it was all negative. You attach positive, it was positive. So COVID's given us a lot of energy. It's washed a lot of stuff, so a lot of stuff can come up now, like these interviews. Yeah. So if you had to pick one priority, if there was just one priority in, in RSA world that we could all help with, I'm putting a call out now, this is your opportunity to say, listen, as CEO of National Body RSA, this is our primary issue at the moment that we would like feedback in or whatever. That, what would that magic wand, I asked Johnny Slash magic wand moment, what's your magic wand moment in RSA world? Uh, so for us, um, our focus at the moment is support. And we, we've, you know, the, the need for support and the complexity of it requires um, our, really for our support people to be paid positions because that's the reality of today. You know, we're asking way too much of our volunteers and as a result, um, we've got people who are getting older and older and older and older and it's too much for them. So our focus is on A, we've got to f fundraise and find money to pay for pay for that. And then it's it's professionalising our support services. So that's making making sure, you know, all the all the data's, data's there so we can go to government and say, hey, did you know we've got X amount? We actually need to understand the need too because we actually don't under, need, understand the need well. You know, what is it when you say support, that means it's such a broad term, it means so many things to so many different people. And, you know, I'm a big fan of a hand up, not a handout. Um, we are, sometimes we get a bit of an entitlement that I'm entitled to this and, you know, give me money. It yep. doesn't always fix the, the ongoing problems. Um, and the other big piece of support is, and, and being a veteran's wife, although I've served myself as well, but more time as a, as a partner of a, of a veteran, um, 
the woman know when something's wrong? Well, I'm going to use the word woman because that's very sexist. But, but ah, do it, do it, do it. But, but, but it's predominantly wives. I mean, there will be husbands out there as, as well. Um, but we know when things aren't right way before the veteran knows there's something wrong, way before his mates do, and we've got to find a way to make it really easy for those women to reach out and support their their partner, the well, the partners to support their partners, um, and and that's something that I've yet to work out because we've we, we are constrained here by budget, and so we can only do little bits at a at a time. There's this misconception that, that RSA National Office is sitting on billions of dollars. We're not. We're struggling to to um, survive. Um, you know, we lost three staff this year. We haven't replaced them because we haven't got the budget to do so. Um, and we are really, really under-resourced. So we've got great, great plans to do all this stuff, but it's not going to happen overnight because we have to do it as we have money available and as we can fundraise it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and train people to do the role properly as well. Correct. And this is one thing I've helped set up quite a few um, veteran support groups behind the scenes, giving advice, and it was my police advice that's really helped the ones that have sparked off recently. It's like, you have to be ready to sit in a coroner's court. The, the reality is, at some stage, you're going to try and help someone, and they're going to either kill themselves, or something's going to happen where you're going to get pulled into and go, right, what was your part to play in this? And sitting there and saying, oh, you know, I was, I was a trained soldier and I've done combat first aid, it's not going to wash. So if you're in a support position, you should, and this is all across business, you can't ask people to do something you haven't provided the training for. Most volunteers and organizations like this are just doing it out of the goodness of their heart um, or it's self-healing through the support that they never receive. Your biggest advocates, your biggest champions for those of us that do what we do is because you saw an answer that no one listened to and people died. So you're like, well, I'm not shouting up about this because I know this works. Or you miss something. Yeah. And this is why this workshop on Wednesday is so important. Cam missed this. So his mate, he knew something was wrong, but he didn't have the skills to have that conversation. The guy's gone and killed himself. So now, years later, Cam is now getting all these workshops out there. What's the workshop? How to have that conversation. Yeah. And so unless you provide that training and give them the skill to do it, you can't work for Lifeline unless you go through Lifeline's course. So. Yeah. One of my strategies was anyone that's in a, in a crisis response space for veterans outside of, hey bro, I need some help, an official legal entity in New Zealand, you've got to be trained. Now, I'm fortunate being a cop because if I get pulled into coroner's court and they say, Dion, who are you from Successful Soldiers or Dion Jensen of the Lions then to talk to suicidal person? I was a cop for seven years. Did this training, this training, this training. Now I instruct on this, this and this, I'm good to go. But that's why we need these train the trainers course so people are empowered for it. But again, I always say all, oh, some lucky people, well, some hardworking people, most of have mortgages. So That's we'd right. love to be out there supporting and volunteering every day, but then I'm still gonna go to sell speeches and workshops and, and, and contract the consult and all the rest of it to be able to sit here and do all of these things. And so we know that it's either gonna be trauma stuff, um, wounded, injured or ill, it's gonna be value stuff, used to be this, now I'm not, it's gonna be life stuff, but it's all gonna come down to the last thing we need to talk about, because I'm not afraid to talk about this, money. So it's a business. Regardless of whether it's a registered charity or not, it is a business, yes or no? Yes. It's a business. So the lifeblood of business is revenue. And then a charity, it's donations and everything else. And that's a dangerous business model as well because there's only so much funding dollars, there's only so much money from poppy appeals, and I'm thinking more of uh, what's other revenue streams that we can plug into the RSA. So um, I study a lot, um, not university stuff, but I just study what works. And um, Anthony Maturi is like the hotel inspector guy. He goes into hotels and the first thing he does, he looks at the space, he looks at the capabilities and how can he generate any more revenue in there. And so I see that in the RSLs. Now, pokies, alcohol and gambling is not the ideal revenue stream we need because for the support side, alcohol is not a good thing. But there's plenty of other things that we can use those spaces for. We understand those spaces. So money-wise, are you sitting on millions of dollars? No. Can you access millions of dollars? No. <laughs> I wish I was. Moving forward, what immediate step, let, let's talk military language, 50 meter target, 100 meter target, 200 meter target. What's the 50 meter target that we can all jump in and help with? 
Well, you know, you know, every every time you donate is, is great. You know, people want to donate. Um, but even just being a member of a local RSA, you know, for every member, um, we get $10. Um, for, if you join the RSA, $10 of that goes towards capitation to the national office. That doesn't cover the running of the office, but that's the, the our biggest revenue stream at the moment. We try not to focus just on capitation. We're, we're actually our focus is more on you know we need to get better at fundraising we need to be more professional fundraisers we need to um and that, that becomes difficult because every time you know someone um, slams the rsa or it looks like we're disorganized or it looks like we don't know what we're doing that makes sponsors run a mile because they don't want to be associated with something that doesn't look good um so that's a real challenge as as, as well for us um but our big one is government should be funding the the looking after of veterans. So, you know, we're trying to get what's called um, social sector standards, which is what you need to get. You have to have that tick, you know, it's a benchmark to say that you're professional. Um, we're working towards that and then that will allow us to go to places like um, um, you know, uh, Ministry of Health or MSD or whatever and apply for contracts to run something. Because you think every service, every service that a, def a defence person needs, they're already paying for that stuff already. There's already a social service. You are service preaching to the choir. Why are we running all of these courses to support veterans through trauma when we've got veterans that have programs <laughs> that they've been through, have designed and have this all available? Uh, uh, you're preaching to the choir because that's what I'm doing with the Line Academy. Yeah. So the Line the Line Academy is a box with many rooms that plug all these different budgets into. So I can run my Protecting Women courses for domestic violence and access funding from ACC. Yeah. Um, I had a rape victim come to me. I helped her out in 10 minutes for something she hasn't been able to, to deal with through a $16,000 ACC course. Why? Because I deal with rape victims all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, you're right, and, and, and that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. But to access government funding, you've got to be transparent, you've got to be professional, and you've got to be accountable. Yep. And and um and you've got to do it. You've got to be able to deliver. So we're um just making sure we've got all our you know eyes dotted, and our teeth crossed, and and we can prove that 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 sort of thing, and um and just meeting their standards, and then we will be going and asking various government departments for, for, for this, this funding and that's not to say we'll get it because it, all these fundings are contestable but um, that's our, our plan at the moment is to make sure that A we can deliver, B we can be transparent and, and C we can make sure that we get positive outcomes because government doesn't throw money um, into a bottomless pit where you can't prove what you're doing works either so you know and all that requires data and IT systems and, and so yeah. So anyway, I'm going to finish off with a gift to the RSA. I'm 10 grand to speak for 45 minutes. That's Australian dollars if you go through New Zealand celebrity speakers. And yep. all my workshops are 12K US. And corporates buy them because they work. So my gift to the RSA is I have a very strategic jigsaw puzzle mine. Next strategy session, I'll come. If you want any of my workshops, any of my speeches, you just tell me what you need, they're yours. All right, oh, RSA, RSA money is no good to me. All right. <laughs> But I've got access to a lot of stuff and I've got a lot of influence out there that we can steer positivity. But I'm I'm wrapped, absolutely wrapped to see that we're starting to see a consultant's mindset to come in and fix some stuff out. Oh, look, thank you for taking the time. Um, we're all on the same page. Look, anything that I've got that you need, just let me know. Um, I, I'm not joking when I say how important the RSA is to my family.